fair in most of the places. On the education front, we are almost doing, I mean, almost rather, we are, we are number one. When it comes to the, you know, infrastructure, we have a perfect infrastructure through the, you know, roads, network, the, you know, ports, airports, and all that kind of thing. So this particular session, which was supposed to be for the R&D session, is basically, you know, we are having number of one in the industries. We are having a sizable presence in all other things where either we are at number two or at number three. I'm not repeating that for the sake of repetition because we are only short of time and I thought that I'll cut down that part. So basically, you know, we are either number one or in number two, be it FDI, be it any industry or anything, be it any, you no know, kind of, uh, our, we are contributing about 9% of the you know, GDP of the country. So with that set up, with the, with the kind of factory we have, the largest number of industries in the entire country, so there is no reason that we should not be number one in the R&D. Now as you are aware that R&D is a challenge for the whole country as such, we stand somewhere very low as far as the you know, percentage of the GDP, uh, somewhere like, still it is less than 1%. Some of the developed countries is already 3% and no, I don't know, some of you are maybe aware that Israel has the highest, which is some 4, 4.5%. It is followed by US and some other countries. And on the overall also, if you look at our neighbors, you know, we always keep, you know, say that we will become superpower and all that. So that is, we need to be realistic and we need to kind of step up our you know, things when there is a focus is going on these IoT things, artificial intelligence and all that. So therefore, the, the, the purpose of this context setting is that how can we increase the R&D spend, how we can increase our position in, 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 in the global, so that people from the R&Ds can be, start, in fact, the, from beginning, you know, the, it is expected that R&D or for that, uh, SNT, you know, science and technology, biotechnology, space, these are all central subjects. And therefore, Government of India will come out with the funds, then only the science and technology or R&D will happen. So, that we need to go beyond that. All these, all our national institutes on these things, and many places, are, including Tamil Nadu, we have already starting, you no, know, laying out separate budgets. Though there is no separate SMT department, but my department takes care of this thing. And at the, at, the, at the end of this session, what I am looking for is that what the state government needs to do. So that the, the at least R&D which you are talking, at least if it is double, if not triple. Somewhere we are talking about that at least 2% of the GDP should increase. So when that can be increased, how that can be increased, Government of India alone will not be sufficient. State government alone may not be sufficient. The private sector has to come in a big way. And that is why we are having eminent speakers from different fields, you know, including you know, uh, the lawyer which I included, so that you know, people can come out that the IPR issues and other things. So with those words, I would like to end myself here. And just my job is only to provide this platform. We have got very, very eminent people who are you know, uh, going to make presentation and the talk on the you know, very interesting topics. So, and for the questions and sessions, I would expect or I would request that you may please hold on and all the questions can be addressed in the end. So now, before I hand over to Mike to one of our uh, panel colleagues, I would like to you know, introduce Mr. Subramanian. Now, he is you know, one thing which we thought that is a success model in front of us. He has been taught by IIT professors, so I don't know whether they were teaching, they were his teachers or not. So he, you know, kind of studied here, went to Cornell Industries, worked in GE International, and came back to work, and came back to give to the society, give to the place from where, to the motherland from where it has gone. And we really want that more and more such people can come. This not only indicates a trend, but also the commitment that people are coming back, they want to come from the other countries, they want to come back to India, and they want to invest in this. 
So with this, you know, growth story which is happening in India and particularly in Tamil Nadu, we look forward that we have more and more subramaniums and uh, I would expect that all of you now start investing something either through your unit or maybe through your existing or maybe by setting off on this thing. On the behalf of the government, we would like to assure you that we have a very, very robust system where we are helping the data protection and all your no concern on the secrecy and other things. So and the, during the no course of the discussion, you will come to know that we are we are very, very aligned with that situation and we are trying to know address your concern on that front. So now I request Mr. Subarnam to start off the proceedings. something very significant you can take away from this panel. So as uh, Mr. Mangatram Sharma IAS has introduced, um, we have a very eminent list of speakers and we're not just saying that. And I think through my presentation, I will tell you why we have chosen a certain combination of speakers. Uh, the whole idea is to present the entire R&D ecosystem in Tamil Nadu. Right? So the topic is the way forward. But I think the message that we want to give you is that the R&D ecosystem exists today very much. Right? So if anybody who wants to do R&D has all the support services, has all the scientific talent available in Tamil Nadu. And of course, we need to discuss how to take it even bigger, what is the way forward. Right? That is the topic of the symposium. So um, I'll just start with my presentation. Um, why Tamil Nadu? I think you've heard this all day today. but I doesn't hurt to state the obvious, the fact that we have access to very highly skilled human capital. And it is a fact we have excellent brains, uh, we have multidisciplinary brains in Tamil Nadu. We have uh, not just people with academic talent, but people who have used the academic talent to, uh, to spawn various kinds of industry. So that is a huge asset to Tamil Nadu. Uh, we are also the automobile capital of India. I'm highlighting automobile, but we have a lot of other industries as well. We have a well-defined IPR policy, and one of the speakers is actually going to talk about intellectual property, because that is a very vital part of doing meaningful R&D today. Right? And not just when we say IPR policy, we're not just talking about whether we are infringing or protecting. That is certainly one part of it. But the other part is, what is the landscape of the intellectual property in a, in a particular technology that we work on? Right? What is the landscape and in the sense that where are the patterns, historically, technically, and what is the white space as a result of this analysis, which kind of can point researchers towards the right areas to innovate, right? where the areas are uh, not quite filled up with. Right? So that's a key part of the IPR. The, uh, the other part is the diversity of ideas. And then we also have strong government support. So like Mr. Mangatram Sharma said, uh, the government is eagerly looking to see how they can support this R&D ecosystem and truly make Tamil Nadu a global destination for research and development. Okay? And finally, collaborative research, because the name of the game today is multidisciplinary research. Gone are the days where people are pure mechanical engineers or pure electrical engineers or pure civil engineers. So today's research, any given topic requires a whole consortium of disciplines to come together and intersect intelligently to be able to make sense. Okay, so when, uh, so Power Gear as an introduction, right? Uh, and I think I'll lead into the introduction uh, that Sir gave uh, towards me. I was uh, a scientist working in the US, and I came back to India with the explicit intent of setting up contract research in India, right? So in India, certainly there are academic institutions, and now there is a research park which is really making the transition between academic and industry. And uh, there are the, the rest of the support services like the IP and so on. But we wanted to set up an institution which does true contract research, which is by industry for industry, right? Where industry has a set of scientists that are trained in industrial research labs, right? And, and those people are working on research projects towards industry. 
And why do we want to do this? For all these reasons, so that you see on the slide. So we kind of sat down and identified what are the needs in the research and development market space, and we wanted to address all of them. So the first kind of need was the cross-platform development, right? So today's research, so if you take a, a car for instance, a lot of the research in automobiles is now in electronics. So that is clearly something that is cross-platform, cross right? So in other words, to solve that on the right-hand side, we wanted to offer multidisciplinary r &D. In other words, a team of scientists from very, very different disciplines is, is what we maintain, right? We, is what we have uh, under me is a team of scientists in, in very, very, very different disciplines. And all of them work together to solve a problem. Second one is cost reduction and efficiency. Because a single company, right, if they have the bandwidth, yes, they can hire all the skills. But I think the recognition is growing that there's a lot of talent outside the world and you can't outside outside your company in the rest of the world and you can't really hire all talent within your organization right so that thing idea of having a certain minimal lean um, lean headcount within the organization and then farming out even something as high end as your innovation needs that thought is really taking off and it it is happening in india uh, third part is access to diverse technology so that on the right side you can focus on your core competency Right? So uh, an automobile company, for instance, uh, they, they have several core competencies. But then, as an example, uh, as you, for example, move towards electric vehicles, you may want to invent a new kind of battery. And the battery is essentially predominantly chemistry. And that may not be your core competency. Right? So that's a strong reason why you may want to keep your core competency and then outsource what the delta is. Right? First, the next one is rapid innovation. So today, time to market is a big deal. Right? So time to market is, is such a big deal that people underestimate the importance of that. Even in research, where the output of the research is, is uncertain today. So today you may not be very clear as to what's com coming one year down the line, even though you have the problem definition. The timeline is still critical. So you have to be able to define through your experience as to what's coming in, in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. right? And that is something an industrial perspective brings to the table. In other words, the discipline of timelines and deliverables is key to delivering even something as high end as, as, as nebulous as research to the market. And the demand for applied R&D. So uh, this goes kind of along with the uh, uh, the last point, which is the low R&D to product conversion. So we are actually working on, on, on uh, ideas where we are trying to see how we can all collaborate, right? How, how an industrial R&D lab can collaborate with a captive <coughs> multinational R&D lab which, and collaborate with an academic R&D institution and collaborate with an, a research park kind of setup, right? And, and the idea of all of these setups is to encourage collaboration in many right? So that collaboration, we believe, will in totality, essentially, uh, uh, get you the applied R&D that you're looking for. So in other words, what we mean by applied R&D is, is, yes, the technology is one piece, which is a very interesting piece of the research, but the, the mindset that even when you're inventing the technology, the mindset of keeping cost in mind, the mindset of keeping reliability in mind, keeping manufacturability in mind, keeping supply chain in mind, right? Because unless that thinking is enforced as a team, right? So you have folks who are great at the concept, you have folks who are great at manufacturability, you are constantly beating down your head saying that, yes, you can't do this, or this, this is something you can do. Otherwise, we are doomed to fail. Uh, and, and when you talk about startups, especially this, such things are true, because startups, people talk about two valleys of death, right? First is the technical valley, which most startups actually happen to cross, but second is the commercial valley. And why do most startups fail there? Because they think of it as two different valleys, right? And if you, they had thought about commercialization right in the concept stage, then the probability of failure becomes much lower. Right. So that's the message. Uh, what I have here is, I won't dwell on this too much, but just a company background of what we do. We are into four verticals, uh, electrical products and research and development services, which I work, what I just described. We are also into non-destructive testing and manufacture of electric vehicles. So the company itself is a very broad-minded company. We are into both manufacturing and knowledge-based services. And that is the idea, because we want R&D to be co-located with manufacturing. Right? Because uh, uh, that really enforces the discipline. And in fact, we have people from manufacturing as part of our R&D team. So the discipline to make something that is eventually manufacturable is always there. <laughs> so next slide again, just a snapshot of technologies. Uh, we are obviously profit driven and then we have to uh, choose our expertise based on what the market requires. Right. So based on those, 
market pulls, we have defined our areas of expertise, which are namely power electronics. We are into chemicals and material science. We are into embedded systems and sensors. Sensors meaning invent sensors that don't exist in the market today. Uh, we are into MEMS, uh, mechanical, electromagnetics, and uh, high power systems, which is uh, which intersects with our other verticals. Right? And we also consequently play in key markets of aviation, medical, energy, automotive, industrial, chemicals, and consumer. So the, all these technologies, or rather a combination of uh, these technologies, will map into any given application. So somebody from the consumer space says he wants something, then it is usually a combination of the technical skills that they show. Right? And what we, again, the gamut of R&D services that we offer, it covers not just the concept, uh, it, it covers what comes before the concept, which is the business intelligence, which is the legal intellectual property, and sometimes even a market survey, and sometimes we'll have to estimate things like the cost even before you invent the concept, right? Because that tells you whether you have to go ahead with this or not, right? So business intelligence, then R&D, and then what we call NPI, new product introduction, which is essentially the commercialization, right? So the whole gamut of services is what we call true R&D because that's what gives the total package to the customer. Uh, just a few case studies just to show how we approach projects, and this is, this is uh, my last but one slide. Um, so uh, the first one shows a, a, a DNA analysis device, literally about uh, six inches in size. It's a tabletop uh, device that we did for a customer. And uh, what we have listed below that is the component skills that go into that, right? It sounds like a biology application, but what goes into it is materials, electronics, power, and thermal. Right? And uh, we also work uh, do a lot of R&D in electric vehicles on the drivetrain, on the user interface, on the chassis. Right, and the component skills there are electronics, mechanical, power, and chemicals. And uh, we, we work in smart grids in the energy, energy domain, and uh, which involves power, materials, controls, artificial intelligence, and so on. Right? So just to give you a glimpse of what a classic industrial R&D project looks like. It, it's, 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 it's application driven, not to, meant, not to say that there is no fundamental research. There is fundamental research, but it's always driven by an application. So hence the market is also already there that you're doing the research because the market is there. Right? And I'll close with this, which is an introduction to the rest of the panel. Um, so uh, at this point, I'd, I'd like to thank the government again for inviting me to moderate this. Um, so what I want to present is the picture here, which is on the left side, you have the R&D providers. right? And, and uh, on the right side, you have the consumers or the end users of R&D. Right? And uh, so kind of a rough sketch. Right? And what we have tried to do in the panel is to have a representation from all the major blocks of this. Right? So you have on the top, you have academia, and so we have IIT that's represented. Dr. Bhaskar Ramamurthy, the director of IIT, is going to talk about it. Uh, and associated with that, or right on the red line, which is making that interface, is the research park and the incubation ecosystem, right? which is kind of both the R&D doer and the receiver in some sense. right? And then. Among the other R&D providers, you have government R&D organizations, you have industrial captive labs. Today, if you see in industry, most labs are captive. Right? If, if an industry sets up its research lab, it's for its own research. Right? So you have the industry captive labs, and then you have the contract research folks like us. And on, on the right side, you have the industry consumers of R&D. Right? So industry does both. They do R&D internally, and they also are the end, final end users. They are the ones who commercialize. And then you have the government consumers of R&D. Right? And in between, you have all the R&D related services, which is the IP, product design, manufacturing, etc. So the point I'd like to make is we have representation in this panel. We have carefully chosen the panel, and they have thankfully accepted for all of these parts. So Dr. Bhaskar Ramamurthy represents the academia part. Dr. Ashok Junjunwala represents the research park, IIT Madras research park, which you'll hear about. And then um, uh, Dr. S.K. Nayak represents, uh, he is from the Department of Atomic Energy, uh, from the Heavy Water Board, so he represents government. Okay, and then we have uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sanjay Gandhi, who is uh, a specialist in intellectual property law, so he'll talk about the importance of IP. Right? I think I covered everything. And we have uh, Mr. Karthik Atmanadan, who heads the electric vehicle uh, um, uh, uh, department of Ashok Leyland, so he'll talk about that aspect, right? How industry perceives R and D, and what the issues are, and what the solutions are, right? So, with that, I will hand it over to the panel, and uh, you will hear from all of these component folks 
And as I said earlier, the message again is that all the components are already here, right? And all we are trying to do is to integrate this, combine, come up with a, a joint offering, right? Uh, uh, so because all of us are kind of working individually in some sense, we, we cross paths once in a while. But I think uh, to really take Tamil Nadu to the global stage, right, we have to present our capability in, in these terms.